speaker, um, Dr. Jyoti Bahrani. She's um, a nephrologist and associate medical director at the University Hospital of Birmingham. She's an honorary clinical lecturer of the same university, training program director for renal medicine, as well as internal medicine. She is also a Royal College of Physicians Regional Advisor for Nephrology in the West Midlands. She trained in renal medicine in the north of Scotland, and she's an experienced educator with postgraduate qualifications from the University of Birmingham and Warwick. She's also the clinical lead for the Advanced CKD and Peritoneal Dialysis Service. Her research interests include decision-making in the pre-dialysis setting, acute kidney injury, health inequalities in modality choice for dialysis, vascular access for dialysis, peritoneal dialysis, end-of-life care in dialysis, and cognition in dialysis. She's authored over 40 peer-reviewed publications, including several meta-analyses. And she's been awarded several research grants, including two from the NIHR Research for Patients Benefit Program. So we welcome you, Dr. Jyoti Barani, and um, I will hand it over to you now. Okay, thank you, uh, Maureen, and thank you to the um, AHN for inviting me today. And that uh, introduction made me sound much grander than I actually am. Um, I am more or less a jobbing nephrologist who happens to have a lot of interests and I've sort of cultivated, um, you know, roles as I've gone along. I, I have an interest in education and the interest in education really came from the fact that I had very good educators um, when I was a senior house officer and a registrar. And um, I think it, it, there is a bit of an art to getting people to do renal medicine and uh, you know, getting them to stay in renal medicine because it is quite a, a competitive specialty to get into, but it's hard to retain people because certainly in the UK, there's very little scope for private practice. So you really come into it for the love and you certainly stay in it for the love. Um, I suppose one of the things that most of you will not know is that I am actually, uh, I was actually born in Africa. I was born in Kenya in Mombasa um, and I came to university um, in 1987. I still do have family in Kenya and we were due to travel to uh, Kenya in the summer, but because of the elections, we had to cancel the plans because as some of you will know, Mubasa had to have a recount and they were in lockdown for a couple of days. So um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is about pre-dialysis care, you know, when it should start, um, how I think it should be best practiced and, uh, you know, where it's headed. So just going on to share my slides. So what I'm going to plan to cover is uh, a little bit about when the pre-dialysis phase should begin. Um, can we slow CKD decline at all in patients? Uh, what are the risk factors in the pre-dialysis stage? What components of good pre-dialysis care look like and how uh, patients should be able to select dialysis modality? I'm just going to cover very briefly when should dialysis start and how much dialysis is actually adequate. And then we'll end off with a Q&A session. Happy to take any questions at the end. Um, but in the meantime, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat box. Um, I'm going to start off with, you know, what encompasses the pre-dialysis phase. So this, of course, is from uh, the sort of improving global outcomes in CKD. Uh, workshop that took many took place many years ago, and it, the definition of CKD is, of course, a sustained drop in the renal function, which is over three months, um, as well as markers of uh, kidney disease in the form of either proteinuria or structural abnormalities or any history of previous CKD. Um, you will all be aware of GFR categories in CKD as well as albuminuria categorization. And I just have put this up really as a reminder that you know, the CKD uh, occurs in many, in more than one stage. And for the purposes of this talk, I'll really be talking about patients at the sort of stage where the GFR is below 25 mils per minute. Um, you will have seen this heat map um, produced by, again, the KDGO working group some time ago, and 
this uh, heat map is used very successfully, certainly in the United Kingdom, for general practitioners or primary care physicians to try and identify patients with underlying CKD and also trying to figure out when to refer to secondary care. We have a, um, a coffin-shaped population curve in the United Kingdom in that you know, we have more patients over the age of 70 than we do um, at the age of less than 35. So if GPs were to refer every single patient to my clinic with a GFR of 30 to 40 mils per minute, we'd be inundated. And certainly with COVID, we've had a lot of issues with trying to be able to catch up with the backlog. Um, COVID hit the United Kingdom in about April 2020, and uh, we've had several surges where all medical resources were really redirected towards the front door. In the United Kingdom, uh, renal medicine is really considered the back door. So, you know, it isn't something that tends to present um, at the front door unless somebody has unrecognized CKD or an acute kidney injury. So we weren't able to see these patients uh, effectively for about a period of 18 months and monitoring them uh, remotely obviously wasn't adequate. So I think that th this heat map is, is particularly useful in places where there is a established primary care structure as it is in the UK. And it enables GPs to know when to refer, when to keep them in secondary care and when to just simply monitor them. That's not to say that if some, a GP is concerned about a 30 year old with a GFR of 30, uh, that they can't just pick up the phone and speak to us or do an electronic consultation. Uh, but, but this is something that certainly we use very much uh, in, in the United Kingdom. And just a reminder that, you know, uh, cardiology has moved on quite a lot with various biomarkers of how to pick up uh, myocardial infarction, but GFR and indirectly creatinine remains the troponin T of nephrology. It's still considered the best overall index of kidney function, and just a reminder that normal GFR can vary depending on whether you're male, female, um, how big you are, how small you are, and what age you are. Uh, the, the National Kidney Federation, of course, recommends using the CKD epi um, creatinine equation, but there are other useful calculators around. And in the UK, my hospital has moved to the CKD epi um, uh, GFR calculator, having used the MDRD for many years. And uh, you will all know that the GFRs are all available, GFR calculators are all available online, uh, free of charge at kidney.org. So how do, how do um, we evaluate somebody with CKD? Well, it depends on the stage they come to me, but I'm, I would be hopeful that when a patient presents to my pre-dialysis clinic, they will have already have been seen by one of my colleagues in the general nephrology clinic and been referred because they are at risk of progression. Uh, they should have had some renal imaging, so we do that as standard. And depending on age, um, we would do various other tests, such as looking for underlying causes of CKD, immunology, as well as virology, and depending again on um, the stage, you know, various other tests that uh, I'm sure you're all aware of. Just a brief reminder about GFR and age. Um, Patients who are elderly will not have a normal GFR. And I think um, certainly in, in, in the United Kingdom, we had to raise awareness amongst primary care clinicians that you, know, you wouldn't expect an 80 year old to have a GFR that was completely normal. And patients who also have other conditions such as poor nutrition uh, are you know, without one limb, have chronic illness, um, or, or are from a different uh, ethnic background or obese or very elderly or very young, there is a, uh, a norm to the GFR. And what we recommend locally is having a very lean attitude uh, for two patients with a GFR of 25 or less. And lean really comes from the sort of motor industry. Uh, it is a rapid improvement, quality improvement process where, um, it is about improving flow and eliminating waste, which sounds very non-clinical, but it does work if you have a whole host of patients with GFRs that are quite low. 
the heat map is a good way to try and figure out which of these patients are going to progress to renal failure that will require dialysis and or transplantation, and which patients are probably going to um, you know, die of something else or succumb to something else before their kidney failure progresses. And that helps us certainly in the UK uh, to direct things to the right people at the right time. If you're busy seeing very elderly patients with GFRs of 30 or 25, then we will not be able to give everybody the due attention that they need. Um, so if, if you haven't read about the lean, lean um, systematic process, I suggest you do so. Um, it, it is quite a useful way to try and concentrate on uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, the thing that's being tackled at hand rather than trying to do too much and try and then doing it badly. Um, slowing progression of CKD is possible, but despite our best efforts, we know that some patients will have rapid decline and the lean process and the heat maps also allow us to pull those patients with a slightly higher GFR who, know that, who we know that are going to decline. So if I have a 40 year old in the diabetic clinic who has a GFR of 30 and then six months later, the GFR is um, 20, sorry, not 30, so the GFR of 40 and then six months later, the GFR is down to 30. Because of their age, we know that they're on that sort of rapid declining pathway it would make sense to pull that patient into the pre-dialysis service. So slowing progression of CKD really depends on two things. One is the type of disease it is. We know that diabetes tends to progress quite quickly in certain groups of patients. And also we know that the more people look after their primary condition, um, they, they are less likely to progress. So if patients are non-compliant or non-concordant with medications for hypertension, we know that despite the best will in the world of the clinician, they will still have a moderate to uh, rapid decline of their kidney function. Um, I'm just going to move on a little bit about, uh, you know, what, what are the things that are proven to slow down CKD's decline. I think nobody will um, argue with the fact that blood pressure control remains the cornerstone of um, managing CKD uh, managing progression of CKD. Uh, blood pressure, uh, control of blood pressure is, is more, more important than the agents that are used. I think a lot of people get hung up about um, what's the best agent. And I think in, in countries where resources are poor or patients are not able to afford drugs, look, getting a blood pressure down to normal is probably more important than the, the class of drug that's used. But in, in general, if a patient has got proteinuria, uh, and there's no other clear drug preference, then I would go for an ACE. Um, and um, if, if uh, the patient doesn't have proteinuria, I would still go for an ACE, provided they don't have an underlying vascular disease. Um, and the way we normally um, start ACE inhibitors in this country, and most of my pre-dialysis patients will be on, um, on ACE inhibitors by the time they get to my clinic, uh, is what we do is we sort of monitor the serum creatinine use. And I think we've over the years, we've sort of had a higher threshold of not stopping ACE inhibitors. The jury is still out if um, ACE inhibitors do reduce decline in kidney function or not. The stop ACE trial, which is um, sort of UK based trial, I think is due to be uh, announced at the late breaking trials of the ASN this year. So we'll find out a little bit more and my center was one of the uh, units that contributed to, the, uh, to this uh, trial. Um, and what we tend to do is that we tend to continue with GFRs. I mean, I think uh, as clinicians, we're particularly bad at titrating the GFR, uh, titrating the dose of the ACE inhibitor upwards, but there's no absolute GFR cutoff, certainly in the UK, unless there is a decline in the GFR, which is uh, sort of ongoing. Uh, we try and avoid volume depletion. And these are the target blood pressures that we would uh, aim for. We certainly do not use ACEs and ARBs in combination anymore because you know, there's a documented risk of adverse events um, as well as hyperkalemia. Like I said, you know, lower blood pressure slows GFR decline and we know that. So I think this is a very simple thing that we can do for all patients. It doesn't take much in the way of um, 
uh, commitment on the part of the clinician. It does require some commitment from patients in that they have to take the medication. Uh, my mantra to patients is I can give you the medicines, but it will only take effect if the medication makes contact with your mouth. Um, because I think, uh, you know, we have a group of patients that feel that they have the medication and it'll just work because they're filling in the prescription. So the compliance is a big issue, I think, certainly in the, in the first world. And we do have to sometimes, you know, um, do urine tests on patients just to prove to them that their compliance is poor. The controlling proteinuria, again, you know, these are very old trials uh, that have been out for some time. Uh, but, you know, controlling proteinuria with ACE inhibitors uh, and ARBs are, are the sort of the golden standard at the moment. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors are obviously um, the new kid on the block. Uh, that not only do they decrease glucose and sodium resorption, uh, but they also, um, you know, lower blood pressure, lower albumin, urine albuminuria, and they can result in a modest weight loss initially. So again, that's a very first world problem. Uh, for, for us, certainly dehydration uh, can be an issue in failed patients on diuretics. And uh, if somebody's GFI is less than 45, so in my pre-dialysis clinic, I wouldn't primarily use them for um, uh, lowering glucose. I tend to use it for its renal protective effects. But you know, th th this is quite a good schema of uh, patient selection. You know, who's eligible and sort of previous trials um, and and how to follow up patients. I'm happy for the, the the team to send these slides out to whoever wishes to see them again. Uh, this is an interesting aspect of trying to reach uh, the slow decline in GFI and certainly one that we have an interest in and also um, any unit that uses hemodialysis predominantly as their modality of choice, not because they don't believe in PD, but just because it isn't um, something that's economically or commercially viable. So um, it's postulated that putting in an AVF is associated with slowing kidney function decline in patients with CKD. Uh, and this uh, particular study carried out in France retrospectively matched 61 patients who had chosen to have hemodialysis, so had a preemptive fistula uh, put in, uh, with 61 patients who had chosen to have uh, peritoneal dialysis. And both groups have matched using a propensity score. And then they were followed up um, for a period of, uh, of time. And what they found out interestingly that the GFR decline in those patients with an AVF was slower um, and lower than those patients who chose to have um, peritoneal dialysis. Um, you know, and, and I've uh, recently started using QR codes rather than the paper itself. So um, if you were to use your camera to scan that QR code, this will take you directly to the paper. And I find it a lot more useful than trying to put in references that nobody can read. So this is an interesting study that probably needs to be, um, you know, substantiated in larger trials. And one of the postulations is that perhaps those patients who have an ABF, you know, are more proactive about looking after themselves because having a allowing somebody to create an AVF in you before you need dialysis requires some degree of empowerment. And if you have that degree of empowerment, you are going to look after yourself a bit more. Uh, but you would imagine that the group that choose to have PD were also similarly empowered because if they've chosen to have home dialysis, then you know they, they're going to be patients that actually are fully vested in the fact that they will need to look after their medical care in the future. So it's an interesting proposition and one perhaps that is relevant to countries where, you know, fistula formation is available, peritoneal dialysis isn't necessarily available. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to, to note that, you know, there is the possibility that, you know, intervening in this way would um, slow down renal decline. So just a reminder that most complications of kidney failure will start in stage three and then progress. And these are the, the obvious ones that you, know, you will all be aware of. Uh, and I'm just going to go on to say that, you know, certainly in the UK, 40% of patients who end up on dialysis are, are diabetic, mostly type two diabetics. Um, certain groups such as Asian patients progress more rapidly towards kidney failure. 
and females with type 1 diabetes uh, with eye disease tend to also progress anecdotally, certainly in our unit, a lot quicker. And these patients have one thing in common that, you know, they have very poor glycemic control. Um, and then the risk of hyperglycemia obviously goes up as their kidney function becomes more impaired, which makes it more difficult to control their glucose. So they get into this sort of vicious cycle of um, the diabetes being poor and the kidney function uh, progressing. Uh, we know that if we try and improve hemoglobin A1C, not only do we uh, reduce their risk of hyperglycemia, but we also can enhance life expectancy. There have been trials out there to, to suggest that. I think sodium is an interesting thing, is certainly in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, trying to limit patients' uh, uh, sodium intake down to between uh, sort of uh, two to five grams per day is very difficult. Uh, we don't advocate an, uh, sort of a, a low salt diet. What we certainly say is that you can add it during cooking, but try and avoid uh, putting in salt at the table. Um, in, in the West, certainly, most uh, families will have a salt and pepper shaker on, on their table. Um, and also there is a trend to go and buy something called low salt, which essentially just substitutes the potassium for the sodium, which means that they have potassium problems later on. Um, cardiovascular um, risk management, we try and address lipids where possible, and we use um, platelet inhibitors as secondary prevention, but you will all be aware of all of that. Um, the statins are interesting. Uh, most patients who, uh, so it's, it's a measuring cholesterol and lipids is part of the uh, general practice outcomes framework. So GPs will get paid to maintain a register of their patients with hypercholesterolemia. Most patients with CKD will have hypercholesterolemia and will probably be on a statin or uh, azetamide by the time they come to see me. Um, we tend to then treat it to, according to a fire and forget strategy, rather than trying to get the cholesterol down to a particular level. So it's not something that we chase, it's something that we address um, unless they happen to have underlying known cardiovascular disease that we know about. Um, a little bit about anemia and uh, bone management in CKD. So this is when we initiate um, sort of iron therapy. I would like to think that most patients who come to my pre-dialysis uh, clinic are having their anemia addressed initially by oral iron followed by intravenous iron and then erythropoietin. We tend to start um, erythropoietin if the hemoglobin is less than 10 grams. Now uh, the funding stream uh, in the United Kingdom for dialysis patients is very different from the funding stream for patients who are pre-dialysis. Um, and the funding for erythropoietin isn't necessarily available for those on pre-dialysis. So what we have to do is try and find the money somewhere to maintain hemoglobin and certainly establish hemoglobins up above 11, because we know that if they come to uh, dialysis with a hemoglobin of sort of below nine, they will do badly. Um, and, and, you know, we tend to sort of do other diagnostic workup, specifically if the severity of the anemia is disproportionate to CKD staging. We have a number of Asian and Afro-Caribbean patients with sort of inherited hemoglobinopathies. So we tend to look for that as well. And the, what we normally tend to do for the stage four and five patients is that we will monitor their blood tests between three and four monthly and um, do things like um, calcium, phosphate, and PTH. Uh, a bit less often. So th there isn't really much of a differentiation between the stage fours and fives. And we would then treat, um, you know, sort of the vitamin D deficiency and limiting phosphorus in diet, as well as referring to the renal dietitian and considering phosphate binders, uh, depending on what their bloods show. We don't tend to do DEXA scans routinely in these patients because, you know, again, there's no evidence that that will improve um, outcome. If we think somebody has got osteoporosis, then we would just treat it accordingly. Uh, metabolic acidosis, again, is a quick win. So there are certain quick wins in, in trying to reduce decline of CKD. So again, 
it, most patients uh, who have a GFR of less than 25 will have a degree of uh, metabolic acidosis. And it tends to be more severe the higher their protein intake is. And you will all know that having um, a sort of an acid environment doesn't help your bones, certainly doesn't help protein catabolism. And there is evidence that CKD progression is quicker in these patients. Again, this QR code will take you directly to the paper uh, that this uh, study pollutes to. Uh, and correction of metabolic acidosis can slow CKD production and improve patients' functional status. The problem with um, using uh, treatment for metabolic acidosis is that uh, the patients uh, find treatment quite unpalatable. Although we start with lower doses, we do find that if we go above one gram three times a day, and if the patient still has a bicarbonate level of less than you know, 19, likelihood is that they're not taking it. Um, you can use sodium citrate solution, and certainly it's used in, uh, in some groups of patients uh, and baking soda. More recently, certainly in the UK, we've had a, um, a product called Nephrotrans approved, which is an enteric coated sodium bicarbonate, which is slightly more expensive, but it's apparently more palatable and can improve patient compliance. Um, we are trying locally to get it onto our hospital formulary so we can use it. There isn't much of a price difference. So, um, you know, that's something that, you know, we can encourage our patients to take. But again, you know, it, it's not the point of giving it, it's the point that you have a patient at the end of the day who may or may not want to take it. Um, hyperkalemia is self-explanatory. I mean, you know, we, we always use first line is dietary potassium restriction. Um, a lot of our patients who are non-Caucasian tend to eat um, things like yams, cassavas, mangoes, uh, high fruit citric acid, fruit consumption. They tend to drive their potassium, especially in the summer months when the weather is good and the fruit is plentiful. Um, uh, we don't tend to use non steroidals or COX inhibitors regularly in these patients, but most patients in the UK, because you can buy non steroidals certainly over the counter, don't consider it as to be a medication. They would just consider it to be something that they take for their joints. Um, we don't tend to use potassium sparing diuretics um, unless we need to use paranolactone for, for heart failure. Um, but in any of the patients that have hyperkalemia, we get them to see a dietitian in the first instance, then address their medication, uh, address any hidden medications that they may be taking, which is things like non steroidals, or um, because uh, we have a group of patients that, you know, does believe in alternative medicine, they will go and see the homeopath or the naturopath and they'll be given herbs or whatever. Often these can be very high in potassium. More recently, we have started using potassium binders. Um, such as Lacalma or Pitiramur, uh, which are now available fairly freely in the UK, having been licensed by our Medicines um, Health Regulation Authority and NICE, which is the organization that allows medicines to be used in the UK. But personally, I'm not a big fan of using them at the pre-dialysis stage because it just, to me, can just reduce the potassium. But if the potassium, in a way, is going up is a sign that the patient needs to start dialysis. So um, unless there's a good reason, we tend not to use them. So if I have a patient who's got a fistula in place and the fistula isn't quite ready to start, uh, ready to needle, or if the patient wants to have a, that final bit of holiday abroad or wherever, and or they've got a wedding to go to or something like that, but it, I use it more as an adjunct to try and delay dialysis. But, you know, um, in, in some countries and in some units, uh, potassium binders are a valuable asset, uh, you know, that delays, that, that can be used to delay dialysis. And certainly during the, the height of the COVID pandemic, we were using uh, potassium binders a lot more freely than we are now, partly because, you know, we are keen that we don't delay the onset of, delay the need for dialysis just based on the fact that we can get the potassium levels down. Just a reminder that you know, patients with advanced CKD have a higher risk of infection, uh, partly because of advanced age, so they have a reduction in their immunity anyway. Most of them will have a coexisting disease. Many of them will be poorly nutritioned. Um, 
be on immunosuppressive therapy, be uremic, anemic, and they will have a higher predisposition to infection. So it, certainly in the UK, we would recommend that they are annually uh, vaccinated for flu and that they have the pneumococcal vaccine um, every five years. Now also they have a COVID vaccination booster every year. The, the, they have just started with the boosters or are going to start from the end of this month. We tend to immunize patients against hepatitis B um, at the sort of CKD4 stage. You will all be aware that uh, it's difficult to vaccinate patients once the GFR drops below a certain level. And certainly once they've started dialysis, you've almost got a 0% chance of getting them to have a good immune response to the vaccination. Um, so that, that's probably all I have to say about infection. Uh, malnutrition certainly in, in, in the first world is a big problem for patients. Uh, and what we tend to do is we try and get every patient to see a dietitian um, and that they, they can address them. And, and we find that also a lot of patients who are obese can still have a lot of protein wasting because what these patients are doing, instead of eating uh, protein rich foods or foods that are nutritious value because they have very poor appetite, they tend to snack on things like crisps or cakes, which have very little nutritional value. So malnutrition is, is something that you know, we try and address. But again, it, it's very important that uh, you know, patients are given information that they can actually take home it's no point in saying to somebody, you know, this is how many grams of protein you need to use um, unless you can give them a personalized plan or just sort of point them towards the direction of which foods are protein high and which foods are not uh, very high in protein. So in, in, certainly in my clinic, the dietitian will see all these patients and then will provide them with a individualized plan as to what they should be doing and then follow them up in about three months when they come to clinic. And they will routinely use things like hand grip and anthropometry to see if there has been a serial change rather than just relying on the albumin uh, levels. So I'm just going to take a breather here for a sip of water, if that's okay. So, so far, I think, um, I hope I've covered what pre-dialysis care is and when it should start. And when we, we certainly, when we do, when we started, how we get our patients to the clinic a little bit about um, you know, how to address risk factors and what sort of things slow, slow uh, decline in GFR at the pre-dialysis stage. Most you will know about, I mentioned a couple of things that uh, you know, are more novel. Um, okay, so going on to modality selection. So in the United Kingdom, the default modality for patients starting dialysis is hemodialysis about 12% of patients choose to have peritoneal dialysis. There are pockets of very good practice in the UK and certain centers have up to 40% of patients choosing hemodialysis, uh, peritoneal dialysis or home-based hemodialysis. And that is not due to the lack of facilities. What it is down to is the way we talk to patients and the way we sell treatment. Um, I call hemodialysis self-sustaining so what that really means is that you don't really have to do much work to get a patient onto hemodialysis. You know, hemodialysis units are there. They've been built many years ago. Most units, although they have capacity issues, will always be able to fit another patient in. And you know, I say to, to staff that are new in nephrology or medical students, there's always room at the hemodialysis in, certainly at the UK. You know, nobody um, is denied hemodialysis, but it takes a lot more work to get a patient to think, think of analysis. And, and you know, modality choice depends on a, on a lot of things. Uh, you know, what, what the physician thinks. I know that there are still clinicians in this world that think that peritoneal dialysis is a second rate therapy used for second rate patients prescribed by second rate clinicians. I don't happen to be one of those and I absolutely don't believe that. But I know there are people around that do believe that because of whatever biases they may have. Um, there are certain clinical advantages of one treatment over the other, but actually, you know, pretty much equal. Quality of life is also important, but as a clinician, who am I to say what the quality of the life of the patient should be? 
and the rate of complications will really depend on, you know, if this patient already has a fistula in place, what is the advantage of this patient having PD as opposed to having a central venous line for hemodialysis? And patient perspectives are really important. You know, if you have somebody who's in their 80s and, you know, you know that you're not going to maybe be able to be able to keep them alive for more than two decades, um, you know, then survival becomes less of an issue. Uh, quality of life is very individual. And what I say to, to people that I work with is, what's quality of life to you may not be the same to me. Travel is very important. So in Scotland, um, certainly when I traveled, some patients had to travel 80 miles one way to come to a dialysis unit. And although that doesn't sound like a lot when it's snowing and uh, you know the roads are bad, um, that, that is quite a long distance to go. Uh, things like work, hemodialysis, although there's always room at the inn, there's only room at the inn at certain times. So you can only do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or the, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, which means if you're working, you then have to take time off work, which likely means you're going to lose your job. Um, and family, if you have some young, young children, do you really want to spend three uh, days in the dialysis unit, four hours at a time? And the way to look at dialysis modality, in my humble opinion, is what would I want if I was in this patient's shoes? And what we tend to do is we tend to give patients balanced information and then we let them make the choice. Um, I think as clinicians, it's really important that we guide patients to the right choice because shared decision-making is all very well and good, but shared decision-making can only happen when both parties have the same degree of knowledge and same degree of health literacy. And that is impossible to achieve. And we know that PD is actually as effective and can confer a survival advantage, certainly for the first two years, provided it is the initial mode of dialysis. This is very old work by James Heath from Denmark, which shows that you know, survival for patients who start PD um, as an initial modality is markedly better. I think over the years, um, you know, I, I like this because this, this is the only study that has shown a clear demarcation. Um, but subsequent studies and larger studies have shown that, you know, you could probably get away by saying that it's pretty equal. Certainly PD is no worse than hemodialysis. Um, and if peritoneal dialysis is possible, I would certainly advise the patient to go on to PD because as we all know, the thing that dictates, dictates your outcome with kidney failure and dialysis is what your res residual renal function does. And your residual renal function is much more likely to be preserved if you start PD. Um, comorbidity per se, certainly in the UK is not a barrier to home dialysis. So even if patients are elderly or frail, we offer something called assisted peritoneal dialysis. Um, you know, those days are gone when it was thought that PD fluid and sugar was bad for diabetes. Um, high BMI and abdominal surgery can be worked around by using laparoscopic PD catheter insertions. And PEG tube seems to be a big stumbling block for certain clinicians. But don't forget, babies with feeding gastrostomies have peritoneal dialysis, you know? So it's not impossible. And what I say is where there is a way, where there is a will, there is a way. Um, and certainly for myself, um, you know, uh, the way I sort of teach patients and, and clinicians about PD is that there's no way of knowing PD won't work unless you try it. Um, and, you know, if hemodialysis is the, by, is the default in your center, it may be because that's the only modality available, but more likely it is because of your biases. And the only two contraindications to PD are the ones that I have put in this, in this diagram. One is major abdominal surgery, because you are just going to run into trouble with um, uh, things like uh, getting the tube into the right place, because there's lots of fibrosis and lots of scarring. And also if the peritoneum is not functional, and most patients will not have primary non-function of the peritoneum. That's usually related to either previous peritonitis for non-kidney reason, or if they've had been on PD before and they've had failure of PD. Having said that, because longevity in renal patients is improving so much over time, um, you know, th there's, no, there's no reason uh, why uh, patients can't go back onto PD. 
the choice really depends on a, a number of factors, including the, the type of program you have uh, and also the, the education program. Patient empowerment is really important when you see a patient. Who do you send the clinic letter to? Um, writing to patients is an alien concept, but it's very easy once it becomes habitual. It's mandatory where I work and the Association of Royal Colleges has certainly provided guidance. And again, if you click the QR code, it will take you directly to the website with good examples. And the, 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 what I say to young clinicians who come and work with me is, where does your bank statement go? Does it go to your bank manager or does it come to you? You need to be in control. So you can only be in control if you talk to patients and direct them and coach them to take control of their health with hope and optimism. So I say to patients, bring a list of your blood pressure medications. Everybody has a mobile phone nowadays. If you can't bring a list, take a picture of your medicines and bring it to clinic. Bring your medications bottles if you can't, uh, if you can't bring a picture. And we advocate that some patients, certainly elderly patients, bring an advocate to provide support. Patients who come to clinic, they forget about 70% of what I say by the time they leave and they'll forget 90% of what I've said by the time they get home. So it's really important. Um, we know cognitive impairment is rife in patients with CKD. It's really important that patients bring an advocate, somebody who can ask questions on their behalf. One of the other things I tend to do is ask patients to um, you know, write down questions and certainly email me back if they're unsure. Um, and the other thing is really important to have consistent messaging between doctors and patients. So GPs, diabetes doctors, cardiac doctors, kidney doctors all need to be saying the same thing. Um, and certainly our pre-dialysis service is very multidisciplinary. There's a doctor, there's a nurse, primary care clinician remotely, uh, a dietitian, a social worker and pharmacist support. And we also include patients in the decision-making process. I won't just start the medication. I'll always explain to a patient um, what the medication is for and what side effects they might um, uh, expect. We have lots of patient information leaflets. And in the United Kingdom, there is a website called Patient View where patients can go and view their blood results together with, um, you know, uh, markers as to whether this result is abnormal or not. So by the time I get to see the patients the next morning, most patients have already seen their blood results, provided they are logged on to this particular website and um, you know, um, uh, sort of signed up for it. And of course, preemptive transplantation is, is the gold standard of care, isn't it? It's better than dialysis, the next best thing uh, to sort of having normal kidney function. And we try and get patients to come up you know, with family members or, or non-family members to see if they can get a preemptive transplant. But uh, I'm sad to say that in our unit, you know, maybe 5% of the patients will get a preemptive transplant just because, you know, there is that hesitation with having a big non-Caucasian group. But even in Caucasian patients, because people don't want to impose on others, um, timing of dialysis access placement is really important uh, because for us, it's important that we avoid catheter use um, and in my unit, what we do is we've looked over the years to see what's the optimal time for putting in a fistula. And what we found is that AVF creation, certainly in my unit, at least six weeks before starting chronic hemodialysis is the best. But there are various papers out there. Um, and again, if you, if you scan the QR codes, it'll take you to the papers directly. Uh, and the gold standard really should be is trying to get a fistula in about four months before the patient needs to start. Um, dialysis. And, you know, dialysis isn't for everyone. I think as people have got older, um, expectations have changed and everybody expects to live forever. But, you know, patients opting for dialysis, yes, they do have an overall lower mortality, but at the cost of higher hospital admissions, at the cost of reduced quality of life. Um, and, you know, sometimes patients are just given dialysis because it's easy to not, you know, it's, it's a difficult conversation to have with an 80 year old about whether dialysis would improve that quality of life. And you know, and I will know um, that for every patient that I think is going to do poorly on dialysis, uh, they don't. And for every patient that I think will be fine on dialysis, they don't. So there is a trial ongoing at the moment, which is um, the sort of prepare me trial, which is a randomized control trial of dialysis 
versus non-dialysis, which is still recruiting and will be ready to report, I suspect, in about 14, 15 months. When should dialysis start? I mean, this is a very old question, but we know that starting very early um, is associated with a modest reduction in mortality, but it is at the cost of a substantially longer period spent on dialysis. And I think you know, we would follow the guidelines in that GFR plus patient symptoms would dictate when patients start. And I think in my unit, certainly most patients will not start until their GFR is less than eight. Um, the lowest GFR I have uh, started a patient on is at 3.7. And that's because he just refused to start. And he said he was well until he presented to the hospital, um, you know, with, with sort of fluid overload. How much dialysis? I mean, we tend to practice incremental dialysis, but this is one of my other biases with hemodialysis is that patients just get pumped up to three times a week, um, four hours. Uh, and you know that is all based on very old data, but I think general rule of thumb is less dialysis is more in the beginning. It's really important to maintain residual kidney function and also maintain some quality of life and symptoms. And you know there are advantages and disadvantages. Another plug for PD, it's natural incremental dialysis. You know, not everybody starts off with a full whack of PD within two weeks like hemodialysis. So um, I'm just going to conclude, I'm sorry I've gone over a little bit. Uh, I think for pre-dialysis care, please begin with the end in mind uh, rather than the other way around. And I'm happy to take any questions. That's my email address and uh, my Twitter handle if anybody was wanting to get in touch in the future. But thank you again for asking me. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jyoti, for the nice presentation on dialysis. I'm sure from the audience, we have a lot maybe of questions or comments we'd like to share with you. So maybe first we can start on the question and answer session. Um, I can see there are like three questions there. Would you like me to read them? No, no, I can, I can see them. Thank you. So, uh, you so the, first, the first question is how long can you use potassium binders for? So th there's some evidence that in dialysis patients, certainly they can be used long-term. What we tend to do is we would use them for a week or 10 days at the most, and then to check the potassium levels. Because what we find is because we're giving dietary advice at the same time, often the potassium will drop to about 3.5 or something like that. And I find that I don't prescribe it for more than two weeks because it forces the patient to come back for another prescription. So you can use them longer if you look at the the um, you know the the, the sort of the, the the information that the drug companies provide, but at pre-dialysis, I don't use them for longer than two weeks. Um, and then the second question is that what GFR do I send my patients for functioning of uh, fashioning of an AV fistula? So if a patient chooses to have hemodialysis, they will automatically, dis dis despite what their GFR is, get referred to the vascular access clinic and uh, get scanned and have their veins mapped. If they have a very good, easy option of doing a radiocephalic, then we normally would wait until their GFR is sort of below 15 in order to fashion the, G the fistula. If we know it's going to be a higher fistula, such as a brachiobasilic or something that will require two stages, because some of the more higher limb fistulas do require two or three stages, then we will do it at a higher GFR. So it's, it's again, it's individualized. Um, I hope I'm, I hope that's uh, okay. If if you, if I've not answered your question, then by all means, please put in some uh, put put in a follow up. So so kindly comment on the SGLT two and if it is slowing CKD progression in stage three and stage four. So I think you know th there is good evidence that they do slow down uh, CKD progression. Certainly, the earlier they used. The thing is that for I think for most patients, it is the diabetes clinic that will be starting these medications and. By the time they come to me, because their GFR is less than 20, I, I am sort of thinking, you know, is it the right thing to keep it going? We, we, we have started um, several patients, but I think for, for my clinical practice, it's probably too soon for me to say, you know, how many we've managed to have uh, delayed dialysis. But I think the trials are all sort of self, uh, uh, sort of, you know, they, they, they do answer that question quite well. Uh, thank you for your uh, really nice comment. What's the lowest GFR? I think the lowest GFR I've started somebody at is 20. Not sure if there's, there's one. Uh, okay, so there's one for CPD. 
So I think those are the only questions that I can see unless, the, oh, okay, thank you. Somebody else says, can you please kindly comment on the use of alpha ketone, keto analogs? Um, it's not something that I use routinely. Uh, and certainly in the UK, very few people will use them. So I'm sorry, I, I don't have any comprehensive knowledge about the use of um, alpha keto analogs. So my son is at home and he's just, he was making a lot of noise in the background. So he's just giving me an apology note, apologies. I, I, like I said, I have a job in Glenish and I happen to have children as well, so. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I think you've answered very well. And if anybody else maybe would like to comment, comment they can use the raise hand feature. If not, may I welcome Dr. Vincent Lloyd to continue with uh, closing remarks and maybe comments. Dr. Lloyd. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jyoti. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, put it very simply uh, and, and uh, we really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. And uh, I know there's a lot of, uh, I think we have been doing some work on the vascular access side and I hope that we will really take it forward. Thanks very much for the help uh, coming on here and also on, on that front as well. Um, we hope that you would come uh, again and uh, we would certainly be in touch. Uh, and of course, on the other side as well, uh, on the well, ongoing work. Yes, uh, so I would thank, thank you very much for asking. I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, and I would just say that, you know, uh, I'm really kind of you to give me the, the opportunity to present today. Thank you so much. Sir. Can I step okay. in just a minute? Yes, yes, of course, Patricia. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah, Jyoti, that was an excellent presentation, in fact. So a couple of comments from our side, because in Indian subcontinent, I think a little different the system is. Uh, in order to have an effective pre-dialysis care, we need a robust system of reference pattern, which generally does not happen. Either we need a strong system for the referral pattern, or we need to enhance the awareness or health literacy, not just amongst the public, but also amongst the primary care which in fact is lacking in our system. So we need to empower the primary care physicians with when to refer and how to refer and also how to treat the patients, not referring whole lots of them to us. The second thing is even the public awareness, health literacy is lacking among the public. Uh, probably we need to do it from the ground level with respect to the knowledge about CKD because unless the health literacy is their shared decision making at all will not be in an effective manner. Most of the time, we end up in making a decision for the patients rather than they making the decision for their, themselves. The second point I would like to speak about is uh, dialysis. Yes, dialysis is like, you know, I mean, it's it's implied to uh, um, that the patients will be pushed to the hemodialysis rather than giving an option of peritoneal dialysis. In the because in our state of Telangana, we have a specific uh, special dialysis, which is called Hub and Spoke pattern, like a free uh, dialysis that given and a cashless scheme so uh, the moment you see a patient who needs dialysis they are invariably put on dialysis rather than you know uh, discussing with them optional peritoneal dialysis uh, other point that you have mentioned about the distance that they have to travel i think that has a salient uh, um, uh, impact on you know taking the dialysis services so under this hub and spoke model which we have developed and which you are successfully completing about five years the patients have utilized the services in an effective manner because the distance that they had traveled, which was about 300 kilometers, has come down to 30 kilometers. And we don't see uh, significant dropouts or uh, because of out-of-pocket expenditure. So all these things have come down significantly with this unique model, which is not there in any of the states. So that's another thing. Of course, the fistula, the vascular axis. Yes, we are very uh, handicapped as far as the vascular axis is concerned because we do not have such much uh, strong and robust system as that the access is concerned. We do not have the vascular coordinator or vascular access team and we have only surgeons who are available in certain centers, not even in much center. So we need to refer the patients and the time for referral happens to be a little late. So majority of the times, even as of today, we start the dialysis only with the temporary catheters change over to permanent catheters. Meanwhile, we get the fistula done. I think that also needs to be looked into, uh, which is in fact a primary point. That is where the hospitalizations are happening in our center, uh, which can be prevented once, you know, I mean, the permanent access is done. 
So these are the things, and of course, the PD first policy. I think Lloyd, Dr. Lloyd, will agree with me. PD first was introduced in one of the that is Karnataka, but somehow we could not succeed because of the financial flow uh, failure. But then I think under the Prime Minister program, there is an introduction of the system for the PD, which is yet to take off in a successful manner. Hope to see that we give an equal emphasis for PD as well, uh, uh, rather than HD alone in the coming future. So these are the couple of comments which I thought I will share with you. Well, thank you for that. And um, there's a couple of other questions I've just answered by text. But yes, I think, you know, um, uh, each modality has its own issues, but I think, you know, we owe it to the patients to try and help them make the decision. I think, you know, free choice is a bad thing, personally, too much free choice is a bad thing. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we, we can't force people to do what we think is the best for them. But again, thank you very much and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity I've spoken to you. Uh, Dr. Jyoti, there's just two questions. I don't know what uh, your uh, thing is on probiotics. Yes, yeah, so I, I think um, uh, I think I sort of said that um, he sort of said that it's a uh, uh, market driven. I mean, there's yeah. no evidence, you know. I, I think that it, you know what I say to patients, it might not do you any harm, then take it. But the problem is that you know probiotics are part of the food industry, so they're not regulated, um, and yeah. you don't know what people are putting in them. I mean, if you look at the the commonest probiotic in this country is something called Actimel, which has two teaspoons of sugar in it. You know, and even the one that's sugar free has a full dose of saccharin in it. So actually, and you know, I think if patients eat a spoonful of yogurt, that will probably, you know, live yogurt, that would probably be, be as effective, but it's not marketed that way, is it? Yeah. Um, and then sort of somebody's mentioned sodium copper chlorophyllin. Um, I'm sorry, I've not heard of that. Yeah. Um, no. It's probably yeah, I mean, I, I can just uh, step in for that. I think uh, the uh, chlorophyllin he's speaking about is Rinaclor tab. Rinaclor that yeah, he's Rinaclor. Yeah, Rinaclor, I think uh, it's been mentioned that it is useful in, uh, in slowing down the progression of the disease. We are planning to be part of that study, at least in Indian scenario. I'm not sure how it's going to come out, but few studies have that reported that there can be a decline um, in the progression of the kidney disease it's available it's commercially available as a renaclor tablet uh, really eager to see how it's going to work out so we'll wait for that as well yeah okay. yeah thank okay you. everyone good evening take care bye-bye thank you